Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of a, a folk tale, a, a fairy tale that I learned as a child. It's an interesting one because it builds up on every sentence, so every paragraph is twice as long as the previous one. But it's called The House That Jack Built. And I'm changing the title to The Self That Jack Built. <laughs> okay. I, I'm using it because uh, I think a lot of the old nursery rhymes and folk tales have a lot of truth in them. And we're a way to teach children about our condition and reality in some way that they could understand. Uh, so I want you to re think of that as the, how, the self that Jack built throughout the poem. So I'll, I'll just read you two or three of the stanzas. This is the self that Jack built. This is the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cat that killed the rat that, lay, that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the dog that worried the cat that killed the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. And it goes on. And I think that's the way we populate our world. If what I say is confusing to you at all, please bring it up. Okay. And please be patient while I read this because when I use the dictation, the dictation frequently reinterprets what I say. Uh, in this case, uh, the house of Jack built, we begin with nothing more than a name. In this case, it's Jack, but it could just as well have been Jane or Peter or Beth or anyone. So imagine you have a house now that you can put anything in that you would like. And this is your household self. But of course, you want it to reflect how you think of yourself. So you want to look around and put things in it that you think will seem like you. However, you forget that in yourself, yourself is made up not only of the space to use, it's made up also of body, speech, and mind self as well as body self. So these things also create on their own until we discipline them enough to have some control. So that's, a, that's okay though, as long as you're aware that body and speech and mind don't always reflect your actual intent, but often interpret what the mind is with uh, with your body, speech, and mind also drawing from your personal history to fill out the ideals. So this is also true for mind and speech body, as it does for uh, bringing into being what seems like you would like to say about yourself to others. So the problem is that we don't always real, realize that we are creating constantly, not just with our intention, but with our body creating what speech and mind creates and body bringing into being. But it does create an accurate mirror of who we are in each moment as we are. So, for example, when Peter and I first met Chiba Sensei in Japan, we had to speak with her only in Japanese. <coughs> but we were still very new to Japanese. So we asked her if we could record what she was saying so we could study it later. But she said, if we did that, we would probably miss most of what she's actually saying to us. Then uh, I didn't understand it very much at the time, but I do now because I realized that if you listen to a recorded speech, 
you miss much of the meaning of the talk that you get when you are physically present because what happens when someone speaks is body and mind and speech also work together to give the speech. And if we miss the activity of body and mind, we miss much of what the real intention of the speech is and the fact that it changes from moment to moment. And even though we miss it and may not even understand it, we are influenced by what we hear and see in body, speech, and mind when anyone is talking. Now, to go back to the house that, to go back to the self that Jack built, probably you would consider body, speech, and mind to be tools of personal expression only to be used at in your convenience. But instead, you find that each one has a life of its own, like rambunctious children. Body, spe body speaks, mind speaks, and mouth speaks. Mind thinks without any reflection. And finally, the consequences of body, speech, and mind randomly creating creates a world for us that doesn't always have our best interests at heart. So until your mind is clear enough to observe the activity of yourself, how you speak your mind freely mixed together in random ways and body then listens or pays attention and tries to take care of everything by bringing, yes, Beth. Could you please reread from a sentence back, I missed a few syllables. Until your mind is, is that the one or the one before? One before. Okay. <laughs> that might not be so easy. Maybe I'm the only one who missed it. No, that's all right. I thought you're doing just what I asked you to do. Thank you. Okay, here it is. Like rambunctious children, mind thinks, mouth speaks, and body tries as much as possible to bring it into being. And none of it is by your clear intention. So unless your mind is clear enough to observe the activity of yourself and how you do think and speak, uh, freely mixed together in random ways, uh, you end up populating your world with a very clear representation of yourself before you clarify yourself. Finally, you have to discipline and maintain control of your rambunctious children of body, speech, and mind, but that takes a lot of practice. Am I being clear enough at the moment? Okay, please just do like Beth did and interrupt if anything is not clear. To, to get back to the self that Jack built, first you create a name and then you begin to add different things to your house. And eventually you begin to create a personal history of emotional things. So the story goes, at first you just put things in like this is the cat, this is the dog, this is the malt, etc. But now you begin become into a more emotional creations. This is the maiden all forlorn that milk the cow with a bent up horn. And from here on, you add more and more of an emotional history to yourself. This is the man all tattered and torn that kissed the maiden all forlorn. This is the priest all shaven and shorn that married the man all tattered and torn, they kissed the maiden all forlorn, and so on. So now you've created a personal history that you can draw from. And all this while you're populating your world with, not always with friends, because your mind is thinking as it wishes. And if your mouth is also speaking anything, you could meet all kinds of beings in your world. <laughs> so the poem goes on until it has a kind of round robin effect of coming around to the beginning again.
finally uh, we we begin to realize that things are getting a bit crowded in your house and you want now to slow down and, and stop the populating with reckless abandoning. And so from this point on in meditation practice, we begin to take some control over parts of ourselves as we said in meditation. The first thing we do is we stop the momentum on undisciplined thinking and acting and speaking. And then we begin to carefully look at all of it to understand who we really are at this moment as we are. We come to meditation, however, with a very crowded house of mind, body, and speech, body, and body self consequences built up over time. And now we look for some peace of mind and body. We actually have a peace of mind and body, but we don't recognize it because so many things are crowded within us to be heard. All parts of ourself were difficult and trouble in the first time we dealt with them. For example, if we lost our tempers and things that we didn't mean, it was a very uncomfortable time. But when it all comes back to us, that discomfort comes back with it. And there will be a troublesome time again until we sort them all out. But the one thing we do at this point is to begin to really listen to all of ourselves to really make friends with who we are. And while we do this, we develop patience, endurance, and generosity with ourselves. And we develop wisdom to accept us as we are, even to be willing to look beneath as we are. In other words, we begin to trust ourselves. Everything has to have everything that comes back to us has to have its say once again. And we have to take the time to listen to all of it and the accumulated activity of our mind, speech and body. So uh, we have to develop generosity, wisdom to accept ourselves as we are and to be in to be open. Uh, we begin to reintegrate what has become part of us on impulse, emotion of thought activity. It all has to return, reintegrate in us now as unborn possibilities only among other possibilities. In meditation, we gain knowledge and fully accept what we sent out in a state of ignorance and accept that they return to us now so in silence, in silence, the body brings as much as possible until your mind is clear enough to observe the activity of ourselves. How do you speak your mind freely mixed together in random ways and body will always try to take care of it. You end up with too much population of your world with things you never intended to give life to. Finally, we have to discipline and maintain control of ourselves in body, speech, and mind. <laughs> we receive and reintegrate our, tra our traces of activity, but this time we do it in a state of awareness. Even as we sit, we experience wholeness again and we open a very spacious state to let everything rise without obstruction and with full awareness of its existence. And now in silence of meditation, we receive and reintegrate traces of body, speech, and mind. And we experience all of it, all of ourselves again, both the good, the bad, and the difficult. Every time we sit, we open that spacious area and let everything arise without obstruction. Or our spacious state now has room for everything to coexist peacefully. And what was previously reacted to with ignorance and emotion now comes home to find itself accepted. And now in thought and speech, we do nothing but sit 
with what returns and wait patiently as each thought, emotion, and sensation finds peaceful, peaceful resolution within. When you're ready, it's time to jump off the 100-foot pole. Before, it's been years trying to manage ourselves as body, speech, and mind. And we're, when we're ready to jump off, we learn to trust that we are ready to put aside hesitation and entrust ourselves to a, our greater being. And we learn now in the state of unknowing in the dark. And at that point, we can trust, we can jump off the 100 foot pole. And thank you, I'm sorry, everything is a little confusing here. Do you have any questions or did I confuse you way too much? <laughs> Oh, let me just read you the rest of the poem because the poem itself is very nice. This is the maiden all forlorn, the milk the cow with the crumbled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lived in the house, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is, uh, this is the man all tattered and torn that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with a crumbled horn, that tossed the dog that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the priest all shaven and assured that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow, cow with the crumbled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the cock that crowed in the morn, that waked the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with the crumbled horn, that tossed the dog, that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built. And this is the last one. This is the farmer sowing his corn that kept the cock that crowed in the roar, that waked the priest all shaven and shorn, that married the man all tattered and torn, that kissed the maiden all forlorn, that milked the cow with the crumbled horn, that tossed the dog that worried the cat, that killed the rat, that ate the malt, that lay in the house that Jack built, that lay in the self that Jack built. <laughs> So one thing just leads to another and comes around to the same thing of this. They're all connected in some way, which is interesting. Chris? Chris. Yeah, that's, that, that was another thing that I was thinking of. In, in addition to the, um, the similarity between that poem and how we build our sense of who we are and how the stories build on each other, it also occurred to me that when you were reading that, it's also a great way to uh what, what it says to me is is interdependence or like yeah. the butterfly effect how like everything is all connected yeah there's another point like this it's called for want of a shoe the horse was lost for want of the horse the rider was lost for for want of the rider the war was lost for want of the war the king was lost for want of the the kingdom was lost. The kingdom, for want of the king, the kingdom was lost, and all for the cause of the of the shoe. For one, the for uh, anyway. So that's <laughs> the same kind of Charles poems. We ought to do a whole series on fairy tales because they are all so much having to do with our practice. Sorry, what is it, Mark? Uh, Mar oh, no, finish what you're saying. No, that's it. No, I finished. Okay. Um, no, it's a wonderful thread, a, a thread of a story that goes around and it takes you from, it, it does a lot of, a lot of things. It describes a village, it describes a whole war, it has the biggest, the smallest of small details of life, and yet it's a, it's a construction, it's a complete fallacy in many ways. It's a funny 
fun rhyme that children make up, which results in us kind of looking at our own way our monkey mind makes up yeah. that one thing because I didn't have a screw the machine fell apart because the machine fell apart the car fell apart because it goes on and it goes on and on we do this every day don't we yeah so we're always creating even now we create the personal history that we have we're always creating it it's true so and then body speech and mind you were talking you were talking body speech and mind so the body has to be still for the mind they could be things and to say them and then it has to keep adding on and it has to keep the whole because every time you say it, you have to go full round robin with it yeah you can't just say well the king lost the the kingdom which is if we were just staying in the present moment it might be the king is just gone <laughs> Um, yeah, but we keep on going. <laughs> we keep on going. We keep weaving stories about our lives and all the other lives, and we love them. Yeah, it'd be interesting to compare what our personal history is now with what we thought, say, 10 years ago. But we can't because we're too in it subjectively. <laughs> well, that's true. It's another story. Yeah. Rachel. Thank you, Jane. And thank you for illuminating that we're not the little baby kings creating our own story, like there's the narrator, and then we get to change it when we feel like changing it or get advice on how to change it, but that there's not just so much more, <laughs> but within us, without us, that, uh, that interdependence, everything is creating that narrative and and the idea you can uh, you actually can know you know if you have enough shrinks and they have enough tapes you can go back and easily find out what the narrative was that you spouted 20 or 30 years ago and still have that feeling that uh, you know you're you are seeing the truth and you're making it up and so th really thank you very much for the fact you you have something to do with it, quite a, quite an important something to do with it, but th that isn't the, um, that isn't the real story at all. Thanks, Jean. You're welcome. Mike. I was thinking <clears throat> during your talk that Body, speech, and mind is something we have to constantly monitor <clears throat> because it'll build our self without us being aware of it. And that we would build a self through all these interactions and things that we go through in life. And as the poem states, it's like it starts a chain reaction. <clears throat> and if it starts off wrong, it keeps building and building and building, and you're not even aware that you're presenting a self that isn't what you wanted and that so i got the impression and i'm probably you know, you know way off base here is that body speech and mind we have to for lack of a better word monitor because it's what our self is created from and if we don't we create a self that isn't what we even imagine we are and people perceive us differently than we we would hope they would perceive us and so you know it's you know it, it just shows the chain reaction that if something starts off a certain way and you're not aware of it it could build and then by the time you become aware of it it's like wow how did that happen how did that you know, you know what what is that about so I don't know if that's what you were trying to say in your talk. Yeah. You know, that was, was what I got from it. That was what I was trying to say. For example, suppose 
your mind starts telling you when you couldn't do something, I'm just no good at this. I can't do this. And after a while, their mind, their mind and your speech starts reflecting it. You start saying to somebody, oh, I can't do this. I've never been able to do this. And then you start going on on a bigger rant about why, why you can't. Well, it was because this and this and this happened in my childhood. And then after a while, you really believe that. And then you got to go back and undo that piece by piece. <laughs> so, yeah, body, speech, and mind are, I think, our biggest challenges to master. And I think when we do master that, even to some extent, we're, we're not totally at his mercy. Then at that point is the time we jump off the 100 foot pole and start to learn everything in the dark completely unknowing of what's going on. It's harder to unbuild a house than it is to build a house. <laughs> so. That's the truth. <laughs> it makes Thank me you. think of Mil 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 Milarepa, the Tibetan saint, his uh, teacher, when he first started working with his master, he was told to build houses, you know, a lot of rock and everything. And it was really, really hard work. And he suffered so much from it that his teacher's wife kept imploring him not to be so hard on them. And every time he finished the house, his master would tell him to tear, tear it down. <laughs> 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 the house that Jack built. <laughs> Self that Jack built. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Jane, hi. Yeah. Um, I can't find the raise your hand uh, <laughs> emoji. Oh, go ahead, they Matt. changed. Hi, they changed Zoom. Uh, and, uh, uh, for, go uh, ahead. Uh, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That was a, a, a very helpful talk. Um, it reminded me of, um, uh, especially during the discussion of either a talk that you had given before or a conversation we had had during Dokusan where in which uh, you had said you you had made a remark about how much energy it takes to hold a world together I think is is how you phrased it and um and going back to I think it was Michael who just said it uh, bear with me I, my attention spans a little short at the moment uh uh how hard it is to unmake a house and um my my own experience with this in the context of holding a world together uh and, and all of the energy that it takes is that i'm not sure so much at least for myself, that it's a matter of unbuilding a house, but letting the house just kind of fall down, sure. and then and then you know, uh, in, in the sense of another talk you gave, uh, everything must go. I'm not sure that it's necessarily an active process of throwing things out, but just letting go of the energy that's invested into holding it all together i i don't know if i'm making any sense but it, it, it's uh, that think, going I along with right, what you ben. i'm sorry I, I, think what you say, I think what you said is right the energy it takes of letting it go is almost the same probably as tearing it down or throwing it away yeah the 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 poem that you were reading poem story that you're reading it just sounded like with every new experience that comes along that the self is just dragging along everything that came before it and has to so it's just one more um one more uh, beam that gets attached to the house and every time a new experience comes the whole the whole thing has to be pulled right back into mind. You know, it's like we've got to rerun the whole the whole show. 
um, <laughs> rather than just deal with that one experience. I, I, I don't know whether that's relevant to what you were talking about or not. It is, but uh, I, I think that what you mentioned earlier, you know, like the sign in the store that said, everything must go. I think that's the final truth in it. The whole house that Jack built has to change. And that only happens if we master body, speech, and mind. So I thought maybe the next talk I would give would be about body, speech, and mind. It's three bars of gold, you know, that you get in a pinball machine. <laughs> when you see Jack. But that's another said, time. <laughs> for me. I'm what? So oh, I said, when you see Jack, please say thank you for me. <laughs> well, remember, Jack can be Jane or Peter or Beth or Mark or Matt or anybody. <laughs> it's all of us. Thank yeah. you. Uh, could you talk to me a little bit about, or all of us, about the 100-foot pole? I've not really, I've heard of it, but I'm not really, I don't understand all the references to it. Well, I can tell you from my point of view, the 100-foot the pole is practice where we're really struggling with ourself, with body, speech, and mind, trying to master ourself first. And it's all uphill and, and requires great effort. And we think we understand everything because we're told to follow the precepts, uh, practice the Eightfold Path and things like that. So we, we have a clear idea what we have to do. We're always struggling with how do I not kill and things like that is a big struggle as we try to pull all the parts of ourselves together and master us. And finally, when we get to the point where we understand ourselves better and we begin to trust ourselves, then we're near the top. And at that point, there's nowhere else to go except to jump off into a state of unknowing. So we go from being told this is what you have to do practice this and this and this and do this and this and we suddenly find ourselves in a place where there's no one telling us what to do and we wander in the dark and we learn in the dark kind of like the uh lotus at the bottom of the pond we keep coming up into the dark water but we're forming leaves and stalks and things and we're heading up towards the top of the pond but everything is in a state of unknowing. Of what? Unknowing. I, I asked the priest in the temple in Japan once why everything was so difficult at this point where I was at the time. And he said, that's because you're like someone wandering in the dark and you're always stubbing your toe on so, something, bumping into somebody or getting bumped by somebody or falling over furniture. He said, it's just because you, you don't know how to navigate in the dark yet. <laughs> so I, that was a big surprise because for me, life is just very difficult at that point. And I didn't think it was a different type of practice, but I understood that later. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because people need a lot of nurturing and guidance and then at some point, the guidance and the nurturing doesn't do any good. Well, the difference is that in the dark, everyone becomes a teacher. And in the dark, everything you learn is a teaching, something to master in yourself. But you may not see that you're pushing up through the dark water, you know, forming a bud or something. You don't know what you're doing. All you know is that you can't see progress like you did when everyone was saying, well, master the precepts, do this, do that, you know, don't do this and don't do that. Do good, don't do evil. Nobody tells you anything anymore, but everyone you run to is a teacher. Everything you bump into is a lesson. And that's the marvelous quality. I think learning in the dark has a great magical quality to it because all the enchantment of your life starts to bloom and show itself to you. And he couldn't do that in the world where you think you know everything. It's only when you're wandering around in the dark and you don't have any idea what's happening. 
and you don't trust what's happening until at some point you begin to trust that everyone you meet is telling you how to get out of the dark, how to practice even in the dark. Even when they're giving you the opposite. Even if they're being insulting, sometimes they can, they can tell you the most incredible things. But I think the world is an incredible place anyway. You know, like I can remember a time I was living in Philadelphia and very, very uh, sad and, and lowly and, and miserable about everything. And one day I was walking down the street and a big truck pulled in front of me and parked in the side street. And I first, my first reaction was, darn, you know, and I kind of walk around it. And then I saw the whole side of the truck said, Jesus loves you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing was, I felt okay after that. You know? <laughs> So don't discount anything that happens in your life. It's all magic and wonder <laughs> if you let it be. And just trust that you're growing whether you want to or not. Like the lotus, you can't stop the growth once your roots are in the ground. So you put the roots down when you're climbing the pole. And then when you jump off, that's when you come up under the, in the dark water and start to send up stalks and leaves and even buds. But it's all in a state of unknowing because you don't have a clue what's going on. So you learn to trust all of yourself. Everyone you meet is now a teacher. Every situation is now a lesson to be learned. And that makes the world a magical place, I think. Because there's not always gravity. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, once we jump, we're in the dark. That's there right. There might not be gravity. There might not be all those expected calamities. <laughs> well, the calamities happen, but they only happen if you end up making a mess of what's happening. Mm -hmm. If you end up fighting with the people you meet or making a big fuss, like if you stumble into a mud puddle and instead of getting out and wiping yourself off, you just sit there and scream and yell and splash until you're totally money. <laughs> That's the only catastrophes you have is the ones you do to yourself in the dark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I will continue the theme a little bit later, but not, not now. Okay, it's time for service. <laughs>